Good morning. My name is Fred Lasky, and I'm the Executive Director of the Massachusetts Water Resources Authority. And on behalf of the Board of Directors of the Authority, who represented today by Chief Paul Flanagan, and all the employees of the MWA, I would like to welcome you to Deer Island on this beautiful day. Cardinal, thank you for pulling some strings to get a nice day. We appreciate it. Um, Deer Island has a long and sometimes dubious history, but now it, now it houses the country's second largest sewage treatment plant, which is a national environmental success story and is the most popular island in the national park system here for the Boston Harbor Islands. I hope the descendants of those who perished here find solace when they visit this memorial in this beautiful location overlooking Boston Harbor. Frankly, it took my breath away the first time I came up and saw it looking across at the skyline of Boston. It is now my honor and my privilege to turn it over to the man who needs no introduction, the Corporation Counsel for the great city of Boston, Gene O'Flaherty. Good morning. What a wonderful, wonderful event today is. And I want to thank all, each and every one of you for taking time out of your Memorial Day weekend to come here and pay tribute on this hallowed ground. You know, this project started many, many years ago. Many good intentions. But to get it over the finishing line, I met with a group of remarkable, remarkable individuals. Recently in my office, I met with Mark Porter. I met with Peter O'Malley. I met with John Flaherty. And I also met with so many other people. <laughs> it's going to happen to all of you. <laughs> but they truly, truly, it was a wonderful, wonderful meeting that I had with these men. And each of them described to me the difficulties and the bureaucratic mazes that they had to go through to get us all here today. Mark Porter literally bulldozed his way through bureaucracy and received uh, wonderful help from the MWRA uh, to make us uh, this event what it is today. I have to tell you what a wonderful story it was to listen to them when they heard them talk about reaching out to Robert Flynn down in Pennsylvania, who made this beautiful stone with the hands of Central Americans that made this, this rock behind us, and Mexican immigrants that built it as well, and Robert Flynn from Pennsylvania driving seven hours to come here and look at this site, and the Feeney brothers figuring out how to get it and set it up, and Local 25 with all the work that they did. What I heard from these men was that nobody said no to get us to where we are today. And I had to, after a while, think to myself, it must have been all these souls that have been sitting here all this time, knowing that they weren't forgotten, but pushing people along to make all of us give them a permanent marker today. May God rest their souls. For the opening prayer, I'd like to invite up to the dais Father O'Leary. A reading, from the, a reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. It was about noon and darkness came over the whole land until there three in the afternoon because an eclipse in the sun. Then the veil of the temple was torn down the middle. Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. Now there was a virtuous and righteous man named Joseph, who though he was a member of the council, went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. After he had taken the body down, he wrapped it in a linen cloth and laid it in a rock-hewn tomb in which no one had yet been buried. The Gospel of the Lord. We have that very powerful example in the Judeo-Christian tradition of respect for the body, both living and dead. And so I commend those who have recognized the suffering and death that took place on this land, and we recognize the dignity of those people this day. And so we pray, God of endless ages, <clears throat> through the obedience and resurrection of your son, you revealed to us a new life. You granted Abraham our father in faith, 
a burial place to, in the promised land. You prompted Joseph of Arimathea to offer his own tomb for the burial of the Lord. In this same spirit, we earnestly ask you to look upon this site, this land as hallowed, so that while we may be committing to the earth the bodies of these your servants, you take their souls into paradise. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Thank you, Father. It's wonderful to be in the town of Winthrop, uh, Mike Carney's country. Were it not for Mike Carney, I, I don't think uh, I mentioned a lot of people, but Mike is really the individual that uh, I think pulled all this together. I was told not to say that because he's such a humble Irishman, but I think he deserved it, certainly deserved it. While we were at that meeting that I described, it was, you know, a bunch of guys in a room, and to lighten it up, Peter O'Malley made a phone call and put on speakerphone where we were all serenaded by Maureen Keedy uh, with her wonderful voice. It made that meeting all the more special and made us think of today, and here we are. To hear, uh, to sing uh, both the Irish followed by the American National Anthems, welcome Maureen Keedy. Shadiva stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight all the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rockets red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the Thank you very much, Maureen. Thanks also to the Executive Director, Fred Lasky, and all the MWRA staff for guiding us all here today. We appreciate uh, all of that. 
Well, I also like to acknowledge uh, the Boston Irish Reporter and Ed Forey. They did a wonderful story uh, about this event. Uh, for those of you that uh, may want to pick up a copy of that, uh, you can do so. It's a wonderful, wonderful story. Uh, I'd also like to introduce the uh, Deputy uh, Consul, Consul uh, General from the Republic of Ireland, Aoife Budd, is with us today. Aoife, thank you for being with us. And Mike Carney not only set up this event, but he's also guiding people to seats. He's uh, still doing. Also, uh, Boston City Councilor Ed Flynn is with us today. Uh, Ed, thank you for being here, Ed. And um, at this time, uh, we're going to hear from John McColgan. John is the City of Boston archivist. Uh, and he has managed the city archives since 1995. Uh, with his team of highly experienced archivists, John has built a program that has earned for the City of Boston a wide reputation as a center for research and the professional curation of the city's historical records. John will be sharing with us today the story of the city's role in creating and managing the Deer Island Quarantine Facility, in particular in 1847, based on the historical documents that are preserved in the city archives. John? Thank you, Jean. Uh, Mr. Mayor, Your Eminence, Deputy Consul General, distinguished guests, uh, it's an honor to address this landmark event in the commemoration of a tragic chapter in the story of the Irish diaspora, and to share some of what the city's archives reveals about Deer Island quarantine in the time of the Great Hunger. On Gorta Moor, Ireland's Great Hunger, saw an estimated 1.5 million people die of starvation and disease. Another two million immigrated. Many of these perished from the plagues they fled. Thousands on the ocean journey, thousands more on North America's shores, and thousands in quarantine in places like Deer Island and Boston Harbor. The causes of the catastrophe are enormously complex, but fundamentally they reside in colonialism. Ireland was England's first colony expropriation of land and wealth by an aristocracy alien in race and religion, bred misrule, endemic poverty, violence and war lasting into recent times. The 1801 Act of Union was supposed to combine Ireland and Great Britain into a single body politic, but Ireland remained a de facto colony, an agricultural resource run for the benefit of English industry and commerce. Irish industry was nipped in the bud leaving an expanding population without adequate subsistence or livelihood. Between 1815 and 1845, nearly a million people abandoned Ireland for North America, many thousands to Boston. Then, in harvests from 1845 through 1851, an unknown fungus destroyed the only food source for millions. The imperial government could have deployed its massive resources to prevent people from starving. Laissez-faire ideology prevented it from doing so. It responded instead with measures that were ineffectual, wasteful, or downright harmful. Soup kitchens were closed because free food was regarded as a disincentive for starving people to work. Better to waste money on purposeless public work schemes. The burden of financing relief passed from central government to local poor law units, even though the local bodies were bankrupt. British officials, in any case, saw an upside to the famine. Reducing Ireland's excessive population would bring needed reform to its agricultural economy. Non-intervention with the course of famine was reinforced by ethnic and religious prejudice popular in Britain. Lacking a mission, to focused, lacking a mission focused on saving lives, British policy had the effect of profoundly escalating death and immigration. Boston felt the impact in 1847 when an unprecedented influx of Irish immigrants landed in the city. Hundreds, destitute and sick, had nowhere to turn for food and shelter but the House of Industry in South Boston. Part homeless shelter, part hospital, the House of Industry was the city's workhouse and asylum for the poor. In April and May, 429 arriving refugees were admitted, many carrying in the filthy rags they wore lice, bearing the highly contagious scourge of typhus. 86 of them quickly died. The disease had spread easily in deplorable, crowded conditions aboard the coffin ships that brought them. 
The infection now spread among the institution's regular inmates, nurses, attendants, and officers. The specter of what was happening alarmed Bostonians, and a burgeoning anti-immigrant nativism intensified. With typhus crippling the house of industry, epidemic threatening the city, and refugees still flowing in, the city aldermen and common council formed a special joint alien passengers committee to deal with the crisis. Faced with citizen disquiet and a fiscal conundrum, the committee enforced laws requiring shipmasters to post indemnity bonds for the support of foreign paupers. To address the public health emergency, it established a quarantine hospital on Deer Island for the care of sick indigent immigrants. 172 years ago today, May 25, 1847, the committee appointed Dr. Joseph Moriarty as hospital superintendent and resident physician. The hospital opened May 29th, the last Saturday in, in May, as is today. Committee members met on the island to oversee the launch of operations. Their, their meeting minutes record a unanimous decision to locate a burial ground, and I quote, near the northwest side of the most northerly hill on the island, unquote. James Turner, the new hospital steward, was also on the island. In the eight months of his employment, Turner would bury 365 immigrants in that ground. Across the harbor, Captain Ellis and first mate, Mr. Knell, sailed the sloop Betsy Ransom on the first of countless journeys transporting the ill from Long Wharf to the island hospital. Anchored off the island's southern point were the first two Atlantic vessels to land passengers at Deer Island Quarantine, the Bach General Green from Cork with 95 passengers, the ship Clearborn from Liverpool with 259 passengers. Calvin Bailey, city inspector of alien passengers, declared 11 from the Clearborn indigent and secured bonds from the captain indemnifying the city for the cost of their care. The port physician, Jerome von Kronenschild Smith, found two passengers from the, the General Green and six from the Clearborn suffering from malignant diseases and ordered their transfer up island to Dr. Moriarty. One of the six, Mary Connell, age one, would die on 3 June, the first victim of the great hunger James Turner would bury on Deer Island. In the first four months, the hospital admitted 1,779 patients. 1,175 were discharged. 214 died. 13 were taken dead from ships. Among these statistics were the McCarthy family from Sligo. Patrick and Alice, in their 40s, with seven sons, ranging from 13 years to six months, arrived August 4th aboard the Iowa out of Liverpool. Five-year-old Patrick later in life wrote of his family's harrowing and tragic experience immigrating to Boston. On the eve of their departure, someone broke a hole in the thatched roof of their cottage and ran off with a large side of bacon meant to sustain the journey to America. Presumably saving himself from starvation, the thief deprived the family of the sustenance that may have avoided the death that robbed the boy of his parents and two siblings on Deer Island. Through the eyes of his five-year-old self, Patrick recalled the well-worn route of the famine immigrant, the cattle boat to Liverpool, a cruel and galling symbol played out a thousand times of people and food exported on the same boat. Following the stay at Liverpool and the Atlantic journey, the family landed at Deer Island, where a large tent on the quarantine ground failed to shelter them from the rain. City death records reveal the, his three-year-old brother, Philip, dying of typhus on the island August 9th, the infant Peter of a virulent diarrhea on September 2nd. On September 7th, Patrick and his brother John were walking about the grounds when their father called to them from a window in tears that mother was dead. A few days after this happened, Patrick wrote, I noticed a large striped plaid dress of my mother's hanging on a line out of doors and stood looking at it for a long while. A woman came to take it away and I made a vigorous outcry of protest and was hustled off somewhere. Six months later, his father died at the hospital of a fever relapse. After release from the island, the orphans, sheltered and fed by relatives and Catholic charities, survived the streets of Boston, except younger brother James, taken by cholera at the Fort Hill Hospital in 1849. 
such a childhood, yet Patrick McCarthy would one day obtain a law degree from Harvard and be elected mayor of Providence, Rhode Island. Good for Patrick. Now, we're all familiar with the cold welcome given the Irish by native Bostonians, the religious and racial prejudice, employment discrimination, the sometimes violent confrontations. Yet a closer look at the archives reveals that the host community was not altogether without compassion. In June 1847, the president of the Common Council reminded his colleagues of the virtue of caring for those in need regardless of who they were. Remember, said the Brahmin, George Hillard, that if these poor people had not thus taxed our benevolence, they must have died. You will not, I am sure, be weary in well-doing or refuse to feed from the crumbs of our abundance the starving poor, even though they be aliens to the soil. They are our brethren still. They have the claims of a common humanity besides those of urgent need. We are men before we are Americans or Englishmen. They are as near to us as the faint and bleeding Jew was to the Good Samaritan. The starving man is our neighbor, and he that is in distress is a brother. It is in this spirit, I believe, that doctors and staff at Deer Island struggled to save the lives of Irish famine victims charged to their care. Wherever in the world there were famine fevers in 1847, doctors and medical staff were dying. On Deer Island, they knew the dangers, yet were willing to risk life and limb, life and health for their humanity. In Dr. Moriarty's case, the motivation may have run deeper. Moriarty was a Brahmin from Salem, married to a grandniece of John Hancock. He didn't need to take this job, jeopardizing his life, his career, the happiness of his family. Why did he so earnestly seek the position? Might it have been because his name was Moriarty? His great-grandfather was an immigrant from Tralee who fitted out privateers for Washington's Navy during the Revolution. Was it because of his Irish heritage he was now on Deer Island with a passion to care for the people of his forebears? Is this proposition supported by the fact that half the names on the staff were Irish? Whether it was for the Irish or for the city or for humanity, Joseph Moriarty, age 37, infected by the typhus, made the supreme sacrifice in December 1847, dying in the arms of his wife in the Hancock Mansion on Beacon Hill, leaving her and three young children behind. There were others. The intrepid sailors, Captain Ellis and Mr. Nell, perishing from typhus, contracted from patients in transit aboard the Betsy Ransom. And the most well-known Boston casualty of all, stricken with typhus, Captain Daniel Chandler, House of Industry Superintendent, War of 1812 veteran, and convert to Catholicism on his deathbed in June 1847. These were the first responders of Black 47 in Boston. They gave their lives for others in need and deserve to be remembered. Among Boston's famine immigrants themselves, mortality was vast. An inscription in this powerful monument as inscribed in this powerful monument, 850 innocent people died and were buried on Deer Island between 1847 and 1850. How many more would perish in the island's institutions in the years to come? How many more escaped death in Ireland only to die in the House of Industry or the Fort Hill Cholera Hospital or in the street or to perish of typhus or dysentery in the asylums and prisons and mental hospitals? or succumb to tuberculosis or typhoid in the North End's ramshackle tenements. Numbers cease to mean anything. The 850 souls on the island have become a poignant symbol of famine-era tribulation endured by the unnumbered thousands who suffered trauma, poverty, disease, and untimely death, ultimately thanks to a government in London that placed political power and private profit over poor people. The Deer Island Irish Memorial fulfills a years-long aspiration commemorating Boston's great hunger fatalities. The Celtic Cross, an icon of Irish heritage, has signified since ancient times a place that is sacred. Victims of Ireland's great hunger share this ground with peaceful Native Americans starved in confinement on the island during King Philip's War of the 1670s. This cross marks 
as sacred, the earth of Deer Island holding remains that testify against colonialism, greed, economic exploitation, and political repression that have inflicted upon Ireland, Native Americans, and many another people down to the present, the tragedies of famine, war, and forced exile. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Appreciate all of the history. And certainly, uh, when I was talking to uh, Mike Carney and, and the others that day, they mentioned you in particular and how much work and how much research you've done. I was also given that day a, a, a list of probably close to 900 names uh, of men, women, and children uh, that are buried on this island. Uh, and just last night, I left it on the coffee table and this morning uh, my wife Patricia mentioned to me that just how taken aback she was all of us know the history all of us know the ships all of us know the great hunger all of us know the reasons that caused it but when you see as she said to me this morning those names and the cause of their death and their age it really brings it into focus and it uh, it's a just another reason so appreciative why we're all here today to remember them. I have the uh, pleasure uh, of introducing now uh, the mayor of the city of Boston, a lifelong champion of working people, a proud product of the city of Boston, the city's 54th mayor, just sworn into his second term on January 4, 1st of 2018, born and raised in Dorchester by immigrant parents, Mayor Walsh, every day is driven to make sure that Boston is a city where anyone can overcome their challenges and fulfill their dreams. As a friend and a former legislative colleague, I can attest to his long commitment to immigrants. And as mayor, he has taken a national posture on making sure that we never forget how these people were treated 150 years ago and remember the dispossessed and the hungry that are arriving on our shores today, and to never forget that link. Ladies and gentlemen, the mayor of the city of Boston, Martin J. Walsh. Thank you, Gene. Let me, um, first of all, um, thank you, John. That was amazing. Um, John McCulgan, our city's archivist, um, for his research. and and telling a story that a lot of people, we know the, the stories, but we don't know all of the stories. I want to thank you, John, for what you, what you did here today. Um, to Cardinal Sean, Monsignor Leary, Father Kickham, thank you for being with us today here. Um, to the, Consul, the, the Consulate of Ireland, uh, thank you for being here as well today. To Gino Flaherty, uh, my friend and his wife Tricia for, for emceeing this, thank you uh, for being here as well. Um, to Fred Lasky and the team uh, who helped at the MWRA, who helped move this along. Uh, I know I can see as I was coming in today, as we all came in today, you can actually see the pride on the faces of the workers that are working today, uh, on, on today, on the unveiling of this beautiful memorial. So I wanna thank you, Fred, for what you do. to Council Flynn, uh, to Kin Council Flynn's dad, Ambassador Flynn, um, to the members of the Ancient Order of Hibernians and the Ladies Ancient Order of Hibernians, thank you for your support in this project uh, and, and traveling to be here today. To the Boston Current Rowing Club for your participation, thank you as well. Um, I want to acknowledge there's so many people, as Gene said, there's so many people over the years who had something to do with today's events. Uh, and if that simply means that you had a conversation 25 years ago in a living room about building this, uh, that was, that was your part of this. So to all the people, I want to thank you. There's too many to, to mention. I do want to mention a couple, the late Dr. Bill O'Connell and Reed O'Connell deserve special recognition. And we can tell that they're smiling down on us today because it's not raining. And they kept, the, they kept the clouds away. Uh, and to those who worked hard in recent years to make this memorial a reality, we're grateful for you. Gene already mentioned Mark Porter, 
John Flaherty, Peter O'Malley, Ed Forey. Uh, special thanks to Mike Carney. Uh, and I know there are other folks out here. To all, of the, to all of the Irish immigrants that are here with us today, and there's a lot of you, like my mother and father, who came to this country in the 50s and 40s, and to the generation before them that came to this country in the 20s and 30s, and the generation that came before them in the turn of the century. I want to thank you. I want to thank you because if it wasn't for two Irish immigrants leaving Ireland, coming to Boston, one to Norwood and one to Boston, a meeting in, in, at the Hibernian Hall and at Intercolonial Dance Hall, uh, I would not be standing here as mayor of the city of Boston. So I want to thank them for, for coming here. But I do want to make a special mention to, to the Irish that are here today from Ireland. Thank you for your contributions to our city. Thank you for your contributions to our country. To the Irish Americans that are here, I know we're proud. We're a proud people. I want to thank you as well for keeping our family's legacy moving forward. Or any, any other nationality that's here. You don't have to be Irish today. Any other nationality. I want to thank you as well. Never forget where you came from and never forget the journey that your family took to get to the United States of America. So I want to thank you for that as well. <laughs> President John F. Kennedy spoke of the emerald thread that runs through the tapestry of the Irish past. He defines this thre thread as the consistency, the endurance, the faith they display through endless centuries of foreign oppression as religious and civil rights were denied to them and their destruction by poverty, disease, starvation was ignored by their conquerors. Dare Island has a place in this tapestry of endurance. The victims that we remember today were far from home, but not yet attached to our immigrant community. So for them, it may have felt as if the emerald thread was broken. But today, in our prayers, our education, and our collective memory, through this powerful memorial, to their hopes and to their hardship, we weave their thread back to this pattern. Like much of Irish culture, this memorial marks profound suffering with remarkable beauty. The truth is, it's unbearably sad to imagine the reality of what happened right here and in Boston Harbor. Children dying of fever in their mother's arms, older people ending their lives thousands of miles from the only homes that they had ever known. Whole families isolated, bewildered, with no escape, but to hold on to each other and to hold on to their faith. Their suffering was a product and extension of the misery being inflicted on Ireland at the time. But it happened right here on Boston Harbor, within the sight of the cities that families hoped and prayed would be their salvation. Most of the time, the immigration story we tell is a story of triumph, overcoming and succeeding. We are rightly proud of our parents and our ancestors, but our city's story and our country's story is the story of those who were lost as well. They took the hardest risks under the worst conditions and suffered the most cruelest fates. All of us who are members of the Irish immigrant community and Irish American community must count them and honor them as ancestors whom we owe a debt. We believe with all our heart that those who were lost here deserve a better fate. They lived as much value and meaning as anyone and should never ever be forgotten. We indicate those across the ocean who caused their suffering, who could have prevented it. But as we mark their loss with a symbol of faith and tran that transcends time, we have the opportunity to act on those values and relieve that suffering as it appears in our world today. We can see in the face of every refugee the humanity of refugees we memorialize today. Let us not be anything like those with power who ignore poverty, ignore disease, and starvation that Ireland saw. Let us honor those who died here 
by seeking to prevent those conditions whenever we can, and by welcoming with compassion those who find ways to our shore and to our borders. We are a country built on an identity, not an idea. An, excuse me, an idea. An idea that life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness are the rights of all people, no matter what their religion, their ethnicity, their resources, or their place of birth. These are the rights that the Irish victims were denied in their homeland. These are the ideas they heard of and they hoped they sought safe harbor here in the city of Boston. And this is the creed that survivors live by as they built up our city and our country like every immigrant before them and every immigrant after them continues to add to our cities and country. This memorial honors the hope of those who died. It calls us to our duty to defend those hopes and make them a reality right here and around the world however we can. This place, what we're standing on today, reminds us the achievement of this idea is no easy task. The treatment of Native American people on this very island in the 1600s is a reminder. The prejudice faced the Irish in their own city at the time of the great hunger and beyond it is a reminder. The enslavement of African Americans, the civil war and injustices that followed, and every act of discrimination that occurs today are a reminder. It takes courage to live up to our principles. It takes work to put them into practice. It takes putting ourselves in other shoes or lack of shoes across languages, across skin color, across religion, across time. It takes seeing common humanity and dignity despite whatever forces would separate us. That's what we do today for these innocent victims as we dedicate a worthy addition to our historic harbor. I want to thank everyone again who has had a part in creating this beautiful memorial. May you all see it as a reminder of who we lost there, bear witness to their hope, faith, endurance, and reflect on the meaning and the values of their lives then and now. May God bless them and hold them close. May God bless their memory. May God bless the city of Boston, and may God bless the United States of America. Thank you very much, Mayor Walsh. There were, uh, as mentioned, so many folks that had big roles, small roles, but every role participated in and resulted in today, so no role is too small. When I was talking to Mike and the guys, they mentioned to me about Ron Whalen, who created the videos for this, about Bernie Callahan, who built the walls, uh, about Larry Hayes, a civil engineer who on his own time did the drawings, I think that Larry Hayes, I might have graduated Mauling Catholic with him. It's not the same Larry Hayes, but in any event. It is? My classmate. Hey, he drew the, did the, that's great. Hey, we made it, Larry. Huh? <laughs> okay. <laughs> there he is. And then uh, also uh, to the tattoo artist, Mike Carney needed uh, a quick drawing of this. And, you know, when you get a scale drawing, you know, it takes time, so... Being the quick-thinking Irishman that he is, he went to a tattoo artist and asked the tattoo artist to draw this. And the tattoo artist was so um, enthralled by it um, that he asked uh, actually to be invited here today uh, and to bring his daughter. That's how special all of this coming together is on so many different levels. Uh, it's now my honor and privilege uh, for the solemn part of this occasion, uh, for the blessing of this great monument uh, to introduce uh, a person who, in, through his entire career, has been so benevolent and understanding of immigrants and has really stood as a model to all of us, as our, to our faith, as to what we should do as Christians, especially in today's climate. His Eminence, Cardinal O'Malley. Thank you very much. Uh, and. And thanks to all of those who have brought us together here and 
and place this memorial here. We live in a culture that has become so hyper-individualistic, and in a day like this has so many messages for us, and one of them is our interdependence and our interconnectedness and how we are connected to one another and connected to the people that, that died on this island and were buried here. Many of those coffin ships that John described arrived filled with orphans because the parents gave all the food to their children and were buried at sea because they wanted their children to survive and get to America. They're very much like those children at the borders of our country who are fleeing oppression and hunger and whose parents are making a supreme sacrifice to, to save their lives and give them a new future. So all of these things have to be uppermost in our mind this Memorial Day as we remember our responsibility to each other, our connectedness to each other as a people. Many of us here are descendants of those people that fled the hunger and the oppression of the 1800s and to come to America. And you know, recently we just rededicated the cathedral. It's such a monument to the faith of those Irish immigrants who in 1875 built the largest church in the United States here in Boston as a sign of their faith and a sign of their hope and endurance. We pray that immigrants coming today will receive a welcome, a welcome from a people that have made that difficult journey and whose families have suffered and who are open to being brothers and sisters to those who are arriving from every part of this globe. And now let us pray. God of all consolation, by your just decree our bodies return to the dust from which they were shaped. Yet in your way of mercy, you have turned this condition of darkness and death into a proof of your loving care. In your providence, you assured Abraham, our father in faith, of a burial place in the land of promise. You extolled your servant Tobit for his charity in burying the dead. You will that your own son be laid to rest in a new tomb so that he might rise from it victor over death and offer us the pledge of his own resurrection. Grant that under the sign of this cross we may by the power of your blessing be a place of rest and hope and may the bodies buried here sleep in your peace to rise immortal at the coming of your son. May this place be a comfort to the living a sign of hope for unending life. May prayers be offered here continually in supplication for those who sleep in Christ and in constant prayer of your mercy. We ask this through Christ our Lord. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Cardinal. <clears throat> At this time, the Boston Curra Rowing Club will be laying a wreath uh, in the water behind us. Uh, I don't know if uh, all of you are able to see it, but while that is occurring, uh, Maureen will read us uh, a poem. This poem is a prayer, and I'll sing it. And it's the, it's the prayer of which was the prayer my grandmother, I heard her say, and I'm sure in the Irish language there was a prayer that these our wonderful ancestors said, and it goes like this. I give a rain is banny mwy de clonog O seem ni si Di bir fiach as fwa A ye a void a rin a gloire Ta hir clwai 
Kirche, spann ihn nicht voll. Oh, ich liebe alles, die Natur, doch so was ist in der Grille O blessed God, our gentle Father, over us keep constant watch. Hold us close in each hour. Hold us close now in our need and deliver us with you in your grace. Thank you, Maureen. In a couple of moments, and thank you to the Boston Curra Rowing Club. Before our closing music, again by Maureen and some bagpipes, uh, as soon as this event is over, uh, thanks to Mike Carney and Green Hills Bakery, uh, we'd like to invite all of you to a reception. And also at that reception, uh, John McColgan has brought some archives from the city of Boston for those of you that might want to peruse them. Thank you all for being here. Happy Memorial Day. While the storm clouds gather far across the sea, let us swear allegiance to this land that's free. Let us all be grateful for a land so fair as we raise our voices in this gentle prayer.